Okay, um, let's get started, and we're a bit behind schedule, so I, 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 I want to move quickly. My name's James Stravopoulos. I'm a judge uh, with the Ontario Court of Justice, and uh, until quite recently, I was actually a faculty member here at Osgood. I have the uh, distinct pleasure of uh, chairing and moderating this panel, a uh, very distinguished panel on criminal law procedure and evidence, which will be uh, canvassing this past year's developments at the Supreme Court with respect to those uh, various topics. And there's been a fair amount that's happened. Uh, criminal law and procedure and evidence uh, tend to occupy uh, a substantial portion of the court's docket, and that hasn't really changed. Um, we are tight for time. Uh, we were supposed to start at 2.15, and as you'll see, we're about 15 minutes behind. So I'm going to spare you detailed uh, uh, introductions uh, of the speakers whose biographies are uh, available online. So if you are online, you can take a look at the conference website. I'll just very briefly introduce the four of them to you in a somewhat more summary fashion than I had been planning, because I'm sure you want to hear what they have to say as opposed to all the details of who they are. Most of them are pretty well known to you uh, and really require very uh, little in terms of introduction. And we're going to be going um, in terms of the introduction in the very same order in which they're going to be presenting, if I remember correctly. So Gerald Chan, uh, who's just down there, uh, raise your hand there, Gerald. Um, Gerald is a partner with uh, Ruby Scheller Chan Hassan Barristers. And uh, Gerald is actually a graduate of this law school, gold medalist, if I remember correctly, practices criminal law, uh, has a real uh, uh, passion for privacy and, um, and privacy rights under the Charter and has been involved in a number of uh, important privacy cases acting on behalf of interveners and the like. So he's, he's going to be uh, speaking first. Uh, down at this end is uh, Kim Crosby. She's Crown Counsel at the Crown Law Office Criminal here in uh, the province of Ontario. And um, she's a very well-known criminal appellate lawyer, uh, very active. Uh, in legal education and in the profession itself. Uh, she's an adjunct professor here at Osgoode Hall Law School and she appears before all levels of the court from time to time and she's a good friend of Osgoode and we thank her for being here. Um, okay, and next to Kim is Lisa Dufremont, Professor Lisa Dufremont, who's an associate professor at uh, Queen's uh, Law School and um, she uh, is very well known uh, for her scholarship. Uh, she's prolific and writes in the areas of uh, criminal law and evidence. And so we're very pleased to have her with us this afternoon as well. And um, uh, last but not least, and he's traveled the furthest distance to be with us, at the end of the, uh, uh, the table here is uh, Professor Stephen Penny from the University of Alberta Faculty of Law, uh, where uh, he's an associate professor. Uh, Stephen also has an interest in privacy uh, and uh, privacy rights, uh, has written extensively on that subject, and um, he's very well known uh, to many of you, I'm sure. He's a frequent participant in this conference, uh, as, as is Professor Dufermont. And uh, we're very pleased to have him with us today as well. So without any further ado, um, Gerald Chen. Thank you so much. And Gerald, it's your prerogative if you want to present from there or if you want to stand at the podium. It's not much of a podium, I know. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'm happy sitting here. OK, um, thanks. Thank you for having me. It's always an honor to be at the Osgood uh, Constitutional Cases Conference. I feel a, a bit like the kid at the adults table. Um, <laughs> And I, I just want to add one disclaimer at the outset. My passion for privacy is strictly intellectual and academic. It has not at all fueled or driven by what I do with my computer in my private time. Uh, that said, um, I'm going to talk uh, mainly about the, what is to me the very sexy subject of computer search and seizure. And it's an area that the Supreme Court of Canada has been very active in in recent years. It's almost like the Supreme Court is making up for lost time because computers have been around for as long as certainly I can remember, and I'm not that young, uh, and the police have been searching computers uh, for uh, evidence of crime for quite a long time. And yet the Supreme Court of Canada didn't really join the party until 2010 in the case of Morelli where it held uh, that uh, there are very few searches, it's or difficult to imagine a search more intrusive, extensive, or invasive of one's privacy than the search and seizure of a personal computer. That was 2010. Just two years later in Cole, the Supreme Court came back to the subject in the context of workplace computers and said that the same is true of a workplace computer, at least where it can be, uh, where it's permitted for personal use or personal use can reasonably be expected and therefore the police also have to get a warrant before going into your work computer, even if your uh, employer consents to the search. Uh, 
And then most recently, just this past November, in the case of VU, the court sort of completed the trilogy of computer search and seizure cases. And it's this case of VU that I'll focus my presentation on this morning. I'm just going to start by summarizing what VU decided and what it held, uh, and then what it sort of holds for the future of computer search and seizure litigation. VU involved a, a theft of electricity investigation, i.e. a marijuana grow-up investigation. Uh, the police obtained a warrant authorizing the search of a residence for evidence of theft of electricity and more specifically evidence showing who was actually living there, any documentation of occupancy or ownership of this property. Now the warrant did not specifically refer to any computers within the residence. And so the question raised in VU was, does a search warrant have to specifically authorize the search of a computer, or is it implied from the fact that the warrant authorizes the search of the residence in which a computer happens to be found? The normal rule in search and seizure law, of course, is a warrant to search a place for evidence of X uh, allows a police to search any receptacle within that place where evidence of X may be expected to be found. That is, the warrant does not have to specifically and explicitly refer to every single receptacle that you can look for in a residence, for example. So if you treat a computer like an ordinary receptacle, then the answer is clear. Specific authorization is not required. And that's, in fact, what the BC Court of Appeal held, that a computer, for the purposes of this analysis, is no different from a four-drawer filing cabinet and therefore specific authorization is not required. Supreme Court of Canada disagreed. The Supreme Court spent a great deal of time in a judgment written by Justice Cromwell going through all of the various ways, important ways, in which computers differ from ordinary receptacles such that specific prior authorization must be required in this context. And there's four differences they set out in the judgment. First. Uh, what we all know, computers can store immense amounts of information. An 80 gig drive desk, uh, desktop drive, gigabyte desktop drive can store the equivalent of 40 million pages of text, and that's far from, you know, the, uh, the largest computer in terms of storage capacity these days. And most of this information, or much of this information, will touch on the, quote, biographical core of personal information that the Supreme Court has held is at the heart of the uh, protection for informational privacy in Section 8 of the Charter. Second difference, a computer is, as Alan Gold has put it, a fastidious record keeper. It contains information that's often automatically generated even without the user knowing that it's been generated. So if you just think of your internet searching history, uh, your browser is automatically programmed to store information of websites that you've been to and search terms that you've used to make it easier for you to, to surf the internet going forward, but that can also reveal to the police intimate details about your interests, your habits, your identity, drawing on a record that you have created unwittingly. Third key difference that the court highlighted is that a computer can store files and data even after the user thinks that that data has been destroyed. So when you hit the delete key on your computer, the operating system doesn't remove that file from existence. It just simply sends that file to a different portion of the computer called the unallocated space, which may not be accessible to the average user, but which is accessible to a forensic examiner. So the delete key really is more aptly described as a hide key in the computer context. Fourth and final difference that the court emphasized was that a computer is rarely a self-contained standalone device. When it's connected to the internet, it serves as a portal to a whole separate universe of information which may contain files and data that may not even be stored within the same country. Uh, and the same is true when a computer is hooked up to a network of computers or servers, as is often the case in an institutional or workplace setting. Now, because of all these critical differences, the court said, this all supports a requirement for specific prior authorization, because only then can we be sure that the authorizing justice, who's issued the warrant, has taken all of this into account. We can only be sure that the, the, the justice of the peace has taken this all into account if the warrant that they're issuing specifically refers to the search of a computer. This is the holding of VU, and I'm going to suggest that it's, it's a fairly modest proposition. 
and that there's a bit of a disconnect between the sweeping rationale that's discussed in the court's decision and the ultimate holding. Because the court makes all these interesting observations about how computers are unique and, and the unique privacy concerns that they raise, but none of those unique features of computers actually come into play at the stage of obtaining a warrant. At the end of the day, a narrow reading of VU would simply suggest that the police have to insert the word computer into their search warrant applications. Now, of course, the, the police have to show reasonable grounds to believe that the computer will contain evidence of crime before they can do that. But that's not a difficult standard to meet when you bear in mind the ubiquity of computers. Almost every residence or office will have a computer. And when you bear in mind the immense amounts of information that computers can contain, it's not going to be difficult to establish that if the residence uh, if you've got grounds to believe the residence contains evidence of crime, you've probably got grounds to believe that the computer contains evidence of crime. So the question then is, is this all that VU stands for, that, that the police have to insert the word uh, computer uh, into their search warrant applications? If so, then I would suggest that VU really is a contribution to police boilerplate more than anything else and, not, uh, and does not make an enduring contribution to uh, privacy law in this context. Um, I think VU can be read to stand for more than that, and that's uh, sort of what I discuss in my paper and urge uh, both counsel and, and the courts to extrapolate from VU. But in order for VU to stand for more than that, I think we have to take all the interesting observations that the court makes about how computers are different and play that out in the next stage of the Section 8 analysis, which is the manner of search analysis. You know, Section 8 of the Charter, one, requires the police to obtain a warrant before searching. That's to prevent unjustified intrusions of privacy. But the analysis doesn't end there. It also, after the search has been conducted, or after the warrant's been issued, requires the police to conduct their search, to execute their warrants in a reasonable manner. And that regulates the extent of the intrusion. And it's, that, it's at that second stage of the analysis that I think a lot of the dicta and observations that the court makes in VU about how computers are different can really uh, ensure that as much of our informational privacy is protected as possible. And the court does go into this a little bit. At paragraph 61 of the court's judgment, the court emphasizes that just because the police have a warrant in hand does not mean that they, can then, they then have a license to scour the devices indiscriminately. Instead, the court writes, the police have to adhere to the rule that the manner of search must be reasonable. And this means that if, the, if in the course of the search, the officers realize that there was in fact no reason to search a particular program or file or device, then the law of search and seizure would require that they not do so. In other words, the police have to respect the ongoing principle of minimization. Yes, they're entitled to search the computer for the evidence that falls within the parameters of the warrant, but they have to do so in a way that is minimally invasive. That's the sort of high-level principle uh, that we can take away from VU as it relates to the manner of search uh, prong of Section 8 of the Charter. The more difficult question is, is where do we go from here? How do we take that high-level principle and apply it on a case-by-case -case basis to computer searches? Are there any sort of general rules that we can tease out uh, from the, case, the cases that have been litigated to date, both pre and post VU? And that's sort of what I try to do in my paper. There hasn't been a lot of law in this area. Uh, the jurisprudence is still in its infancy in terms of analyzing how we look at whether a computer search is reasonably conducted. But let me just, in the five minutes I have remaining, make two quick points that are further developed in my paper. First. I think the courts have to closely scrutinize the methodology used by the police when they're conducting a computer search. What, file, what types of files are they looking at? In what order are they looking at them? Uh, for how long? And what keyword searches are they using, et cetera? And I, I, that's not because methodology is the focus of the inquiry. Uh, many courts, including, including our Court of Appeal in a case called Jones, have made it clear that we're not going to restrict the police to searching certain types of files because that's impractical. Uh, they may need to search all different types of files and, and files may be, file types may be concealed, et cetera. But I think it's still important to focus on the 
police methodology because that can be very telling of the true police objective in conducting the search. And it's the police objective in conducting the search that will often turn, that's, that's where the analysis will often turn. Take the facts of Jones. There the police had a warrant to search a computer for evidence of fraud. That was the objective. Now, in the course of executing that warrant, the police discovered images of child pornography. They then went on to conduct a general search of the computer for evidence of child pornography. That is, they strayed from the original objective of the warrant, which was just to search for evidence of fraud. And the Court of Appeals said this was unreasonable. You have to stay focused on the objective of the warrant. Now that analysis all focused on the objective, but part of the evidence in showing that the police had strayed from the original objective was the methodology the police used. Because in either examination or cross-examination, the officer, the investigating officer, conceded that he started to look at video files, which he would not have done if he was only searching for evidence of fraud. So the methodology the officer used was relevant to show what the true objective of the search was. That's somewhat of a, of a simpler example. Um, there are a few other lower court cases that I cite in my paper where the courts very closely scrutinize the order in which the police look at files and what types of files they're looking at in order to determine the true objective. One final point uh, as it relates to manner of search. The police all often make the claim, and have in many cases made the claim, that they have to examine every single file in the computer because file types can be concealed. So they have to open every single file in order to determine whether these files fall within the parameters of the warrants. And I think that's a da very dangerous approach. It, is, it has the potential to be very destructive of informational privacy when you think of how much and different types and the quantity and quality of information that is stored on your computer. And I also don't think it's, it's necessary for the police to do that in order to identify the evidence falling within the parameters of the warrant. There are a number of cases now in which evidence has been led to show that the police have certain tools available to them to detect the true nature of the file, uh, even when the user has tried to alter it, and to, in cases of child pornography investigations, to simply search by what's called a hash value. That's sort of the, the digital fingerprint of the file. The police maintain extensive databases of the hash values associated with images that had previously been deemed to be child pornography. And so they can often search for child pornography simply by searching the hash values of the files on a computer without actually opening every single image. Now, none of this is to say that these tools are, you know, sort of a panacea or that they're always going to work and that the police never have to go through every single file on the computer. There may well be cases where the police have to conduct a broader, more wide-ranging search of the computer. If you're dealing with a particularly sophisticated target uh, who has an incentive to conceal files and the ability to do so beyond the reach of the police, that may well justify an exceptional approach, but it ought to be the exception and not the rule. Uh, and the analogy I, I sort of think of in my mind is if the police cannot resort to the drastic measure of smashing the front door of a residence down with a battering ram, unless they have grounds to believe that there's a possibility of violence in the home when they're executing a search warrant, then similarly, they should not be able to resort to the drastic measure of opening every single file on a computer in order to determine whether it falls within the parameters of the warrant unless they can establish some basis to do so. Uh, I'll end there. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Kim Crosby. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much for the organizers for inviting me. And as a Crown, I need to say, as I always do, the views I am about to express are not necessarily those of the Ministry of the Attorney General. Uh, it's hard to speak about the Ryan case without briefly mentioning the fierce controversy around the facts. Um, after the decision was released, uh, Mr. Ryan himself, the intended target of the hit, put out a YouTube video calling our criminal justice system a complete farce. His new wife put out a statement on the internet on a blog saying that he's the most gentlest man ever and every, it's all a pack of lies. Um, and as 
uh, Professor Mathenos, who wrote a lot of the uh, op-ed pieces, there was a lot of debate in the, in the media about whether uh, she was actually telling the truth, and there was concerns about whether the RCMP actually failed her in the way that they did. I just note parenthetically that two, two weeks ago, the RCMP got into a little bit of hot water uh, in a detachment in her area for having an officer pocket dialed uh, a complainant in a domestic violence case, and she listened to her voicemail and heard a number of officers laughing about her plight and asking whether or not she actually deserved to be hit. So um, I, I, in any event, I just wanted to note that that is the RCMP that uh, Ms. Doucette, um, the uh, former Ms. Ryan, uh, was dealing with. Um, and yet, at the same time, it's unsettling to think here in Canada with the legal advancements that we've, been ma that we've made and the social advancements in terms of not only our understanding of domestic violence, but also the support services we're supposed to have in place, that an educated woman with a job who's now separated and about to have a divorce with a specific threat uttered a couple of months earlier, that she finds herself in a place where she feels she has no other choice but to hire a hitman to kill her ex-husband. That too is unsettling. And yet at the same time, as we've learned from Lavallee and Ruzik, context is everything. And regardless of the debate around the facts, we have to take it as a given for our discussion what the trial judge found and the two appellate courts upheld, that she lived through a reign of terror for 15 years almost. She lived through regular acts of physical, sexual, and emotional violence. She had uh, to endure threats to her life on a, almost a weekly basis. She had a gun held to her head at least on four occasions. And he detailed plans where he was going to bury her and put gravel over her and her daughter. And he threatened to burn the fucking house down with her and her daughter, their daughter in it. So at some level, as equally unsettling as it is to think she was in that situation, it's also unsettling uh, the amount of opposition and suspicion that was given to her plight uh, in the media. So, the question that I'd like to talk about today is what, how do we look at this, um, this situation where a woman has lived through that type of a reign of terror and, and tries to hire a hitman to kill her ex-husband? Uh, and what I want to do today is I, I don't want to talk about what the Supreme Court could have done or should have done. Uh, I, I do that in my paper. Um, but I do want to talk about the new self-defense provision and, and how that might work, uh, how we might understand that in terms of responding to the next miss to set. I note some uh, think that the new self-defense provisions, like Professor Coughlin, Lisa and I were speaking about this at lunchtime, think that the new self-defense provision is just going to eradicate uh, duress altogether. Um, Lisa and I think that, uh, if I could include her in my thoughts, um, not so sure about that. I think it's going to be hard for the Supreme Court to say that Parliament meant to when it enacted the new Section 34 to just completely eradicate Section 17, which still exists in our code. They don't usually do things like that. I think they'll try to find a way to harmonize the two together. Um, but in any event, that's what I want to talk about. And uh, specifically in the context of looking through uh, the lens of the principle of fundamental justice uh, of moral involuntariness. So as we all know, embedded in Section 7 is the principle that it's only voluntary conduct, conduct that is the product of a free will, un um, a con con controlled body, and an unconstrained mind is going to result in criminal liability. We don't want involuntary conduct to be the subject of criminal sanction and stigma. And so most of the defenses uh, dealing, like the duress defense, is certainly based on this principle of moral involuntariness. And it's based on an excuse. We don't like what you did. What you did is wrong. But nonetheless, we're going to excuse it. That's what duress is, is built upon. And so there, it's basically a concession to human frailty. But not all human frailty. It has to be uh, human frailties of, that a person with reasonable firmness of mind and of the characteristics of that person in the situation. And looking at whether or not that reasonable person in that situation could have ever had resisted the act that they're accused of. So when we look at domestic violence, when we look at Miss Doucette, Lavallee certainly gives us a lot in terms of, you know, as uh, it was just said a few moments ago, it's a breakthrough decision, it's a landmark case, and it's a, it's a remarkable case. And it's certainly given us a lot in terms of how we understand domestic violence. But I'm not sure we've moved as far as we should have since then in our understanding of it. I think part of why at least some people questioned Miss Doucette's plight was because she didn't look like the typical battered woman, right? She had a job. She wasn't completely isolated. She had support of her family and friends, at least at some point along the way. And she, she didn't kind of meet that 
definition that we seem to have embodied in terms of what a battered woman looks like. I think that's part of why some people uh, questioned her, her situation as much as they did. And we have to, we have to fight against that, uh, that notion um, that that's what the battered woman looks like. And we have to move a little bit more in our understanding about the impact of years and years of coercion and, and control. Right? It's not just about the degree of physical violence that a woman may go through. It's about the type of coercion and control that she's been subjected to and what that does to her quote unquote free mind. So, and it, it, that in and of itself can have significant impact on how she perceives her situation and certainly how she per can perceive what she's able to do about it. And there's a great discussion in uh, Professor Liv Sheehy's new book that just came out a few months ago uh, about defending battered women on trial. Um, and I highly recommended that to you. But uh, I think one of the things we need to do more of is think about if, we're, if it really is a prin principle of fundamental justice that you have to have a free will and unhindered mind, then years and years of control and coercion to every, like so many moves that you make, that has to be recognized in terms of how we evaluate women's actions. So self-defense, uh, as we know, came into effect, the new self-defense provision came into effect last uh, March. And um, so the next Miss Doucette has to go there. Duress is not gonna work for her. It might work for other situations. And I, I put one case in my paper that I'll talk about where it did work for a woman who was charged with drinking and driving. She drove in order to escape uh, another beating from her drunken husband. Um, but now we basically have a reasonableness test. It's what would a reasonable person do uh, given that there's a threat against them or another person? And did they commit the assault or the crime that they're charged with? Because it can be any crime, it's, it's very open. Did they do that uh, in, a re in a reasonable way? And the code actually stipulates a number of factors or considerations that courts have to go through in order to assess that. And I want to talk about three uh, in this context. Uh, the first is, um, the code specifically says you have to look at whether the threats were imminent. So uh, we all know that, we're familiar with the imminence for criterion, both from duress and it being struck out in Resic, but also in self-defense cases. And this is where I think the degree of coercion that a woman has experienced, a battered woman has experienced, has to come into the forefront. Uh, the, those acts of physical and psychological, emotional control over a period of years are not unrelated, isolated acts that happen here, right? They're, they're part and parcel of an entire uh, pattern of coercive conduct. And, you know, as the trial judge found in Ms. Doucette's case, Ms. Doucette, that's, she took her, her previous name after, the, uh, after this trial, um, found that she had been subjected to a reign of terror for 15 years. And how can we not understand her plight based on what that would do to her mind? And I don't think it'd be reasonable to say to Ms. Doucette, listen, you're now out of the house, you were able to leave and you lived in hiding for a few weeks and now you're living here. And even though he sat in the car for an hour outside your place of work and you had to call the police, you don't need to worry anymore because it's been two months since he's, you've actually heard him utter the threat to kill you and your daughter. I think when you look at it through the lens of 15 years of daily, th or sorry, weekly threats and that type of violence, that is just not a reasonable question to ask. The code also says now we have to take into account other means available, and I think this is another way of saying, of course, the no other safe means of escape. So that's clearly going to come into, come into question. And many people challenge Ms. Doucette's be, uh, actions because she didn't get up and leave and go to a shelter, for example, and there's, there's two things I want to say about that. First of all, going to a shelter wouldn't have necessarily protected her and saved her. They're fabulous, they're certainly life-saving places, um, but it, when she's on her way to work, it doesn't mean he can, can't get her. He was sitting outside of her place of work. Going to her shelter was not the be it, be it and end all of, of her being safe. But more importantly, what I want to question is the idea that she had to do that in order for her actions to be, uh, to be considered understandable. And what I find particularly troubling is to juxtapose, juxtapose her position to that of the, uh, in our law, not having to retreat under Section 34.2, the old section. So you do not have to retreat from your home in order to justify self-defense. And remember, justification here not in self-defense, not an excuse, right? Duress was about excusing behavior. What you did was wrong, we recognized it was wrong, and we recognized you didn't have a choice, we're gonna excuse it. When you claim self-defense, you actually get to say, what I did was right. And, in our, and you don't have to retreat from your home. And in fact, in Ontario, thanks to Ford and Dougherty, the two uh, appellate court decisions, that's not even a factor a jury can consider. So 
Miss Doucette has to not only leave and then go on hiding and live at her principal's house for a while and then get a new residence, she also has to consider going to a shelter. Okay. So Mr. Angelis, in a case that I did post Ford and uh, Doherty, um, him and his wife are having an argument. They're in the throes of a separation, although they're living together still because neither wants to give, you know, change the status quo for the sake of their children. Um, she was particularly small. She was only five foot, uh, sorry, four foot nine and about 90 pounds. He was probably twice her size. And his evidence, contradicted by the daughter who unfortunately witnessed this, his evidence was she scratched his penis. And at that point, there was a struggle. He got on top of her and killed her. And the court said the Crown in that case was not allowed to ask Mr. Angel why did you not walk out that door? So he's not required to walk out a door of an apartment for five minutes to cool down, five minutes to let his wife cool down. Instead, he asked the court to excuse his behavior in killing her. Okay, sorry, not excuse, justify his decision in killing her. And Ms. Doucette has to go through the hoops that everyone expected her just to even be considered to be able to raise uh, an excuse. I think that is a, something that has to change in our new provision. It's right for challenge. It's certainly, it's based on the old castle doctrine that even the UK where it came from is now second guessing and, and treating very differently. Um, and while there may be arguments about not needing to retreat from one's home, and, and there certainly are those, uh, those reasons. It shouldn't be a blanket. We can't even consider that. And the last uh, point that I want to uh, I want to raise uh, is around proportionality. I have to. One of the things that I find most jarring about Miss Doucette's situation is that she hired a hitman, and so there's that element of premeditation, and that's you know that's where I get stuck. I do a lot of yeah buts, yeah buts in my mind, trying to trying to reconcile this. Is it just the fact that it was premeditated that's so disturbing, or is it that she hired a hitman? And I think you know I, I try to make myself take a closer look at it and say. You know, women, as, as Justice Wilson noted in Lavallee, cannot go into arm-to-arm -arm combat with men, right? Not, typically not the same size, not the same strength, and in this case, not the same access to weapons, right? Mr. Ryan, Mr. Ryan was in the military. He had access to weapons. He carried one under the seat of his car. He laid it on the table many times. He put it to her head. We cannot compare what men are able to do in terms of defending themselves with generally speaking, with what women are. And in fact, the new provision dictates that we have to look at both size, or not both size, gender, physical characteristics, etc. So I think when we're looking at her action, whether or not it was really proportionate, we have to look at that as well, um, in addition to kind of the overlap about um, what what she thought her proportion, her response was, given she lived with 15 years of a reign of terror and lived with that type of coercion and control. And it may be that at the end of the day, we say, you know, that's just never justifiable to hire a hitman to kill someone. But we have to look at it through the lens of, did what she go through affect her mind? Her, did she have free will? Did the years and years of abuse and control she lived under really give her an unhindered mind? Um, and uh, I think those are the types of questions that we have to ask and make sure that not only do we look at the new uh, self-defense provision through the lens of equality, but also through that fundamental principle. Uh, and I'll stop there. Okay. <laughs> Great, because you're under time. Huh? <laughs> 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 Professor Good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you very much to the organizers for uh, inviting me. Um, I decided uh, to talk about Bedford today, uh, which is, as you know, the case in which the Supreme Court of Canada unanimously decided to strike down all of Canada's criminal laws related to prostitution. I confess to some trepidation about speaking about this only in the sense that, uh, that Professor Lawrence in her paper uh, said that this is the watershed constitutional case of the year. So I feel that there's uh, pressure uh, to be the person who's, uh, who's spending the most time on, on this very important case. I wanna speak to two things today uh, in my presentation. First, the broader impact of Bedford uh, on the development of the law under Section 7, particularly the norms against arbitrariness, overbreadth, and gross disproportionality. That'll be most of my time. And then I want to spend some time on what everyone is really interested in, which is the regulation of prostitution and how that might go uh, in the future, what Bedford uh, might say about what kinds of regulation could be constitutionally acceptable in the future. Just some thoughts on that I have at the end. So specifically, in terms of the broader impact of Bedford, 
I want to say that Bedford uh, clarified the tests for arbitrariness, overbreadth, and gross disproportionality and the relationships between them, and that it shows that the Section 7 limits uh, uh, laid out here uh, still place meaningful constraints uh, on governments, that they continue to do that. And then in terms of the future regulation of prostitution, to give you an idea where I'll go with that, uh, this morning in her uh, plenary session, Professor Lawrence said, uh, and I think I got this down uh, verbatim, no one seems to think it is open to government to take a more aggressive approach and actually criminalize prostitution. Well, I am the one person who thinks that it is open to government under Bedford to take that aggressive approach. I'm not saying that they should do that, but I think that's what I want to talk about is whether that actually is open to the government uh, under what Bedford has to say. Uh, so first, uh, I'll, I'll get to that in a moment, I'm, I will make sure to have enough time to talk about that, uh, but let's talk first about the broad impact on the Section 7 analysis. Uh, the prostitution laws are obviously important, but I do think that the case uh, has importance that goes uh, far beyond that. I think Bedford is the new leading case on arbitrariness, overbreadth, and gross disproportionality. Uh, these are all, as you know, principles of fundamental justice that a law cannot be any of those things. Uh, and uh, these are some of the substantive limits that Section 7 places on the criminal law. So I don't want to summarize Bedford, but just to remind everybody of the main holdings, the three prostitution laws were struck down for the following reasons. The body house provision was struck down because it was considered grossly disproportionate. Living on the avails of prostitution was struck down because it was overbroad and uh, communicating in public for the purpose uh, of prostitution was struck down as grossly disproportionate. The main theme, I think, or a main theme that comes through in the judgment uh, was that the government regulation made prostitution more dangerous, uh, and that was what infringed the Section 7 rights of uh, prostitutes to security of the person. So in terms of what are the takeaway points for the Section 7 analysis, I want to make three points uh, today. The first is that arbitrariness, overbreadth, and gross disproportionality are all vital principles, that this case is just another uh, example of the fact that these are uh, principles that are very much alive in the jurisprudence. They're capable of putting real constraints on legislative uh, choices, even in complex areas of public policy like prostitution. So I think it's uh, another way of saying this is that Bedford shows that the PHS case, the case uh, about the Insight safe injection facility, was not just a flash in the pan or a blip on the radar, but that it actually shows that we're in an era where the court is willing to put real limits on uh, government uh, when it acts in a way that is irrational and puts life, liberty, and security of the person at risk. And so I think that's, that's the main uh, sort of takeaway point outside the context of prostitution of Bedford. The second point I want to make is that Bedford nicely clarifies the tests for arbitrariness, overbreadth, and gross disproportionality, and it clarifies the relationships between those principles of fundamental justice. So the tests are now clarified. I'll, they, I go over them in the paper, but just to remind everyone of what those tests are. Uh, a law is arbitrary, says the court, uh, when it limits the Section 7 rights in a way that bears no relationship, or rather no connection, is the word uh, the court uses, uh, to the law's objective. A law is overbroad when some, but not all, of its limits, uh, the, the, the limits it places on Section 7, bear no connection to its objective. And a law is grossly disproportionate in extreme cases where the law has an impact on Section 7 rights that is so serious, uh, as the court says at one point, as to be totally out of sync with its objective. So that's another uh, way of, of phrasing the gross disproportionality test. In phrasing the tests in this way, one important move that the court has made is to abandon the language of necessity in the tests for arbitrariness and overbreadth. So both in arbitrariness and overbreadth, uh, in the past there had been an idea that the question was whether the law was necessary to further the government's objective. This was one statement of the test for arbitrariness. There, there was controversy about whether it was a correct statement of the test uh, in, uh, in the court's previous judgments, uh, unresolved uh, in the PHS case. Uh, but here we see the court distancing itself from that idea that a law is arbitrary uh, because it is unnecessary uh, to achieve its objective. And similarly, the test for overbreadth, as it was laid out uh, initially in the Haywood case, was whether the means chosen by the legislature uh, in the challenge law were necessary to achieve the objective. So we had this idea of that the question was whether the law was necessary or unnecessary. Uh, 
And of course, this language of necessity was extremely controversial uh, because it seemed to invite courts uh, to look into not only the relationship of this law and its purposes, uh, but sort of what are the other policy options that the legislature could have done, should they have done something else. That seemed not sufficiently deferential to government policy choices in these difficult areas. The idea uh, that the government would be held uh, to the standard of, of it having to be necessary uh, to choose the means that it chose. So there was that concern about this language of necessity, and the court has clearly abandoned this language uh, in Bedford. And now the questions for overbreadth uh, and arbitrariness are whether there is no connection uh, to the legislative objective. So for arbitrariness is whether there is no connection at all between the effect of the law and the legislative objective. For overbreadth, it's whether there's no connection in some applications of the law between uh, the effects of the law uh, and the legislative objective. So I would say that this is a positive development in the law. Certainly it resolves an ongoing controversy about what the, the tests should be, especially in the area of arbitrariness. Um, and the language of, of the absence or presence of connection seems uh, more balanced. It does require a higher standard to be met before a court can strike down uh, legislation that reflects uh, the government's policy choices. So there is that clarification of the test that I think is a, 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 a good contribution that Bedford has made. It's also uh, clarified the relationship between arbitrariness, overbreadth, and gross disproportionality. Um, the Supreme Court of Canada has, has made a series of pronouncements on the relationship between these norms that are, when you look at them as a whole, sort of absurdly conflictual. Right? They, they say just about everything about uh, the way these norms uh, relate to each other. In some judgments, it seems that gross disproportionality is required in all cases, and that's the real test. Other judgments seem to say overbreadth is the real test, and everything else is sort of folded into that. And so there was a lot of, uh, of uncertainty, I think, before Bedford about how these principles related to one another. And the Supreme Court of Canada has cleared up this confusion by specifying very clearly, laying out the test for them and saying, that these are three distinct independent constitutional doctrines. That's not to say that they don't have relationships with one another, that they don't potentially overlap, but they are distinct arguments uh, to be made, uh, distinct doctrines. So I think uh, that's, uh, that's a real uh, uh, benefit that uh, Bedford brings in terms of clarifying the law under Section 7. The third and final point I want to make about the law under Section 7 and Bedford uh, is that uh, the court wants to say, I think wants to be very clear, that the Section 7 analysis under arbitrariness, overbreadth, and gross disproportionality uh, does not require a proportionality analysis in the Section 1 sense. So it's not a proportionality analysis, or perhaps another way of putting it is not just a proportionality analysis. So this, I think, is a response to uh, a sort of received wisdom in the academic literature that uh, the challenges for uh, arbitrariness, overbreadth, and gross disproportionality were uh, akin to the Oaks test, that there was a real sort of mirroring there of the Oaks test. Uh, and, uh, and I think if you look at the academic literature about these principles, what you'll see is a fair amount of consensus on, on the following points, uh, and this is before Bedford, of course. So there was some consensus that all of these tests required uh, the uh, court to look into the effectiveness of the law, that what the court would be looking into is how effective is this law at accomplishing its objective. Uh, also, there was some consensus uh, that this uh, analysis, no matter which of these three principles we were operating under, would involve a general propensity, uh, rather proportionality inquiry, a sort of general balancing of salutary and deleterious effects of the law. Uh, and then, uh, finally, there's this idea that this is uh, akin to the Oaks analysis. And I think the Supreme Court wants to resist all of these uh, ideas and says uh, very clearly that the Section 7 analysis has to be differentiated from Section 1. Uh, for all three of these norms, uh, the court says that the comparison is between the effect of the law on the one hand, uh, the effect of the law that is on protected Section 7 interests, uh, and the purpose of the law taken at face value on the other. So if the purpose of the law is taken at face value, there is no analysis into the effectiveness of the law, according to the Supreme Court of Canada. There's no general balancing of the overall social effects of the law. 
and this analysis is qualitative, not quantitative, so we're not looking at how many people are affected, we're looking at whether there's anyone uh, whose Section 7 interests have been affected in one of these, uh, in one of these ways. So the court wants to distinguish uh, the Section 7 and the Section 1 analyses, and I think uh, they provide some bases for making that distinction. Okay, that's what I wanted to say about the contributions to the Section 7 jurisprudence more broadly. On the implications of Bedford for regulating prostitution in the future, I only have a few minutes left. The claim I want to make is that I think criminalizing prostitution in some form is open to the government after Bedford. I want to make two caveats here. The first is that I'm not going to speak about the differences between the kinds of models that one might take, the Swedish model to criminalization as opposed to a broader model of criminalization and so forth. I'm not going to speak to that. I just want to speak to the question of whether prostitution itself could in some form be, uh, be criminalized mm -hmm. uh, and what, how that would play out under Bedford. And I'm also not advocating a particular position. I have to say, as a feminist and a criminal law scholar, I feel like I should have prostitution figured out. I should have a position. <laughs> this is what we should do with prostitution. I don't. I feel like it's a very complicated social problem. And I actually am not sure what the right regulatory scheme is. That's, so I come from a sort of, I don't have a horse in this race when it comes to <laughs> what the actual uh, regulatory scheme should be. And I'm not suggesting that criminalizing is the right thing. I'm simply suggesting that I think it might be constitutionally acceptable under Bedford. Why do I think it might be constitutionally acceptable under Bedford? Uh, three reasons uh, that I'll give to you now. One is, I think it would change the weighing under Section 7 in a really fundamental way. So in Bedford, uh, the two provisions that were found grossly disproportional were found grossly disproportional, uh, I think, in large part because their purposes were not considered to be very important. They were nuisance-related provisions. The uh, communicating provision and the body house provisions were there to combat social nuisances. And it's easy to see that if you have social nuisance on the one hand, uh, and on the other hand, uh, you have uh, people's lives being put at risk by, uh, by these provisions, uh, that that appears to be grossly disproportional. Whether that would still be the case uh, if we were uh, looking at a uh, legislation that had an objective, a weightier objective, like trying to eliminate the exploitation and violence associated with the social phenomenon of prostitution, for example, is not clear to me. So I think that, that, uh, that is, uh, that's clearly uh, up in the air. Um, the court also says that uh, effectiveness of the law is not constitutionally relevant. So while all of you might be thinking, well, criminalizing prostitution wouldn't actually work, right? That's true, that's true of most of our criminal laws, that they don't actually eliminate the phenomenon we're trying to eliminate. Uh, <laughs> but it's not uh, something that, the, that would be constitutionally relevant on the analysis as laid out in Bedford. So there is this uh, idea that, of course, banning prostitution wouldn't work, but the government purposes are to be taken, in the words of Chief Justice McLaughlin, at face value. And then I guess finally I would say the whole judgment rests on the theme that prostitution is illegal. It is not a crime to sell sex in Canada is the very first line and it comes up over and over again. Uh, the message, the overall message I think is that the government can't legislate to make a legal activity more dangerous. Whether that line of reasoning applies equally to an activity that is criminal is not clear. And I simply would end with the thought that uh, I'm not saying that there wouldn't be a Section 7 claim here if, if, if there was a criminalization of prostitution. I think there would. We would have harms associated uh, with criminalizing prostitution in terms of uh, pushing it underground, making it more dangerous. Uh, I think I would simply ask you to consider that a lot of our criminal laws have that effect. It's a reality that criminalizing anything makes engaging in that, uh, in that uh, activity more dangerous. Um, and so there's potentially far-reaching consequences for the criminal law to recognize that making a criminal law more dangerous is grounds for striking it down under Section 7. Those are my comments. Thank you very much. attempt to do something that I haven't done at this conference in the past, and that is to use a, uh, a PowerPoint. So I'm going to see if this uh, works. I can set it up the way that I want. I'm not, I go like this. Okay. Miraculously. Uh, so thanks very much uh, for having me here again. I'd like to extend particular gratitude to Professor Benjamin Berger for inviting me.
Uh, and it's always great to come to this conference. It's always extremely uh, well run. I'm always delighted, delighted to come. So you'll have to forgive me because my talk's going to overlap a fair bit with Gerald's. I'm going to try not to cover the exact same terrain, and I'm going to try to push forward a, a somewhat different a thesis. But I'm going to talk about what the Supreme Court of Canada has done in the realm of digitization and Section 8, our right to be secure against unreasonable search and seizure, and then what it might do or should do uh, in the near future if I have time. And the idea here is that, of course, as Gerald pointed out, police and law enforcement officials have been conducting searches and seizures of computers and digital devices and data from those devices for a very long time. But it's really only in recent years that the courts have become aware that the ubiquity, portability, processing and storage capacities of these devices have really presented new challenges to our interpretation and application of, of Section 8. So there are kind of two opposing narratives that you see in the case law, in the blogosphere, in the media. And, and one of those narratives is that digitization is a grave threat to the social and legal order. So law enforcement officials in particular uh, often complain that criminals' use of advanced digital technologies has outstripped law enforcement's investigative capacities, and they plea for legislators and for courts to restore the pre-digital status quo. And of course, the, the other side, privacy advocates, also yearn for a kind of a restoration of the status quo, but they claim that digitization has been a boon for state surveillance, right? And it's, it's bringing Big Brother ever closer. And so they demand that legislators and courts do something to forestall Big Brother's advance. And I'm not going to try to resolve that question here, although uh, I tend to think that both st sides stake their claims a little bit too strongly. The truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Uh, but instead, my aim is to show that contrary to a lot of thought in this area, that I think our current Section 8 doctrine is generally quite well equipped to accommodate the digitization of search and seizure law. And so it's inevitable that technological change is going to influence constitutional interpretation and application, but I think the foundation set out by the Supreme Court of Canada in its existing digital Section 8 jurisprudence, as well as its, its other Section 8 uh, case law, over the past few decades provides us with the conceptual, conceptual and doctrinal tools that we need to achieve, achieve reasonable accommodations between competing privacy and law enforcement interests. Now, there are a couple of exceptions to that that I'll, I'll delve into where I think there's a need for greater clarification and refinement in the law. So what I do in the paper is go through the history of digital Section 8 cases, looking at them chronologically, case by case. I don't have time to do that. It would be too boring anyway. So what I'm going to do is to skip ahead to talk about, the, I think, the four key principles that we can distill out of those cases that I think will shape the digital Section 8 jurisprudence from here until the foreseeable future. And the first of these principles has been very well covered in Gerald's presentation, and that's the computer's are different, right? They're not analogous in any kind of easy way with other kinds of containers in the non-digital or analog world. And that's become very clear in the jurisprudence, and now it just becomes a question of what does that mean in particular cases. The second principle, which is well established, but nevertheless very important as we go forward, is that we've rejected the third party doctrine as it currently exists in Fourth Amendment doctrine in the United States. The third is the effect of contract and statute in shaping and potentially diminishing or even extinguishing the reasonable expectation of privacy. And for those of you who aren't criminal lawyers or experts on Section 8, Section 8 law, if there's no reasonable expectation of privacy in a particular realm vis-a-vis -vis a particular governmental intrusion, then there is no search and seizure and there therefore can no, be no violation of Section 8 of the Charter. So this is the fundamental threshold triggering mechanism to extending Section 8's protections. And the fourth principle is the one that is the most contentious and ambiguous, hence the two asterisks, and that's the meaning of the biographical core that Gerald alluded to. And there are a couple of different ways in which I think the biographical core test, as it's currently understood, is problematic and we need to flesh those things out. So first, 
and very briefly, thanks to Gerald Computers, are different. So we know from cases like Morelli, where we have the eloquent statement of Justice Fish, that computer searches, and by the way, when the court uses computer, when I use computer, we mean any kind of digital device, including the cell phones you probably all have with you. That this is a very intrusive kind of search because of the nature of the data that's contained, including perhaps information attaching to innocent third parties, and the sheer quantity of information that's available either on the device itself or connected through networks in the cloud and that kind of thing. And we have this once again being repeated in VU, which Gerald, of course, uh, focused on, and we have, in this case, Justice Cromwell talking about the difficulty of analogizing with non-digital you know, analogs, you know, analog analogs, I suppose one could say, right? Mm -hmm. These are misleading analogies, potentially. They can send us down the wrong path. Wrong path. So computers are not cupboards or filing cabinets. And so that is pretty clear. The question becomes, in the application, the defining of what reasonableness requires in the second part of the Section 8 analysis, once we know there's a reasonable expectation of privacy, what does that necessarily mean? What conditions, what strictures do we put in place in order to preserve privacy in balance with lo legitimate law enforcement interests? The second principle, no third-party doctrine. Now, for those of you steeped in Section 8 law, this is a long-established principle in Canada. It's not controversial. But it is far from self-evident that this would, would have been inevitably the case. Because in the US, under this doctrine, any information, personal information, no matter how intimate, intrinsically, that one voluntarily or necessarily discloses to the outside world, say to third parties like your service provider, your credit card company, your grocery store, you forever lose, with very minimal exceptions, any expectation of privacy in that information. So there's no Fourth Amendment protection for anything that is exposed to or collected by a third party. And presciently and wisely, the Supreme Court of Canada has for a long time rejected that doctrine. So in cases like Plant and Gombach, which are digital Section 8 cases that I cover in the paper, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada rejects this doctrine and says, no, we can retain privacy even in information that is held by third parties. And the genesis of this really comes from Justice Laferay's opinion in Diamond where he says that we may, for one reason or another, wish or be compelled to reveal personal information, but situations abound where the reasonable expectations of the individual that the information shall, rem shall remain confidential, et cetera, et cetera, must be protected. So depending on the circumstances, we can maintain an expectation of privacy even when we divulge information to third parties. The third principle is the effect of contract and statute. Now, I've just said that when we divulge information to third parties, we can maintain an expectation of privacy. But there's a caveat. The Supreme Court of Canada has held on many occasions that in examining the nature of the relationship between the person to whom the information relates and the third party that the information is disclosed to, certain kinds of norms can diminish or even extinguish the expectation of privacy. So I'm talking about contractual norms, statutory norms, or perhaps even policies or other types of norms. And this has played out in the Supreme Court of Canada's jurisprudence in different ways. And it's not completely clear what the real influence of these norms is. So for example, in Plant and Gombach, and I won't go through the details of these cases, Suffice it to say, they involved the investigation of grow ups, like about 50% of all criminal procedure litigation or more. Sometimes it seems like it's 90%. In the first two cases, we had differing majorities of the court finding that contractual and legislative norms diminished expectations of privacy to such an extent that, in combination with other factors, the court concluded there was no expectation. In Cole, in contrast, the court held that a teacher who'd been issued a personal computer by his employer, the school board, maintained a reasonable expectation of privacy because he was allowed to use it for personal purposes, even though he had been told repeatedly that the board owned the computer, owned all the data, nothing was private, he should expect that everything could be surveilled or supervised or overseen. Nevertheless, the court said the nature of the information involved was so intimate that a reasonable expectation of privacy, though diminished, 
was maintained in the information. So of course, and sorry, this, uh, let's skip ahead here. Even though we can always distinguish these cases from one another, I think we can see an emerging tentative consensus that I'll, I'll try to summarize. The first principle in this consensus is that Section 8, as the Supreme Court of Canada has repeatedly told us, sets out normative limitations on state power. So in other words, its scope can't be entirely dictated by exogenous norms like statute or contract. So as uh, Justice Deschamps put it in Gombach, the fact that a person claiming the expectation of privacy and information ought to have known that the terms were, et cetera, et cetera, nevertheless, the appropriate question is, should this information remain out of the state's hands because of what it reveals about the person involved, the reasons why it was collected, and the circumstances in which it was intended to be used. So we can consider contract and statute, but they don't entirely circumscribe or define the scope of Section 8's protection. The second principle, this one is perhaps a bit more contestable, is that statute and contract are less likely to extinguish reasonable privacy expectations when those expectations relate to information that is intrinsically or inherently intimate. And so, as Chief Justice, Justice McLaughlin and Justice Fish stated in Gombach, we can consider legislation in determining privacy expectations, but it may be insufficient to negate such an expectation when the information is or the, sorry, the expectation of privacy is otherwise particularly compelling. So this is a dissenting judgment here, so I can only make so much of it, but I think that's the emerging principle. Statute and contract, more weighty, more important, when the privacy, the inherent privacy of the information is slight or perhaps debatable, less influential when we can all agree that the information is highly intimate. And we, Lastly, get to the big one, and that is the meaning of biographical core. So this leaves us with the question of how to judge whether information is intrinsically or inherently intimate, so as to be presumptively deserving of constitutional protection. So Plant set out this biographical core test, particularly important when we're dealing with informational privacy, as Gerald mentioned. Now, like so many other broadly stated sort of pragmatic legal standards, this works extremely well in a great range of cases because we all intuitively recognize that information, say, about people's sexual preferences, political views, religious beliefs, is more intimate, more deserving of protection than, say, your affiliation or fondness for a particular sports team. Nor would anyone dispute that information that comes from inside of a home is deserving of greater protection than information <coughs> derived from more public activities like driving or activities that are more heavily regulated or scrutinized by the state. But as cases like Plant and Gombach illustrate, jurists very often disagree about how to characterize investigative techniques that reveal what I call low resolution information from sources that ordinarily conceal intimate protected activity, such as residential activity. So this disagreement, I think, rests on two key points. The first is the nature of the kinds of probabilistic inferences that can be drawn from the information. So for example, can police reliably infer the presence of intimate activity by using some technological mechanism to sort of peer into a home, right? How reliable are the inferences? You know, what can we say probabilistically is likely going on? Is it fuzzy? Is it clear? So that's the first point of contention. The second point of contention, which is related, is weighing the relative merits of having either brighter or dimmer lines demarcating the boundary between protected and unprotected information or activity. So for example, as the US Supreme Court has done, should we set up a bright line around the home and say no matter what inferences we might draw using whatever investigative technique we might have available, we're gonna say, any information stemming from the home is off limits. It's protected by Section 8. Police are generally going to need a warrant, probable grounds, et cetera, to get access to that information. Even if you can say 
well, the data that you're getting doesn't really tell me much other than the fact that I think there's probably a grow up. Okay? So that's, that's the first approach, bright line. And I've been told I've got to wrap up here, so I'll do it very quickly. Your bright line. <laughs> My bright line. The second approach is to say, well, you know what? Let's just look at the information as it is. And we'll judge it on a case-by-case on -case basis or investigative technique by investigative technique basis and say, what does this information tell us about what's really going on? And there can be evidentiary and factual disputes about that, as we've seen in the case law. But in theory, we should be able to say, all right, this investigative technique doesn't really tell much about what's going inside the home, so it's okay. It's not deserving of this kind of constitutional protection. And in the paper, I suggest how this debate should be resolved uh, in the case, not only of previous decisions of the Supreme Court, but one that's currently pending, and that's the Spencer decision that was heard back in December uh, and presumably will we'll get, uh, get a judgment on sometimes this, this year, which deals with subscriber information in child pornography investigations. So if anybody has any questions about that or the Fearon case dealing with uh, cell phone searches, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. But thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks so much.